Bonjour. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I came right from Brazil. So for me, it's uh, such a, a pleasure to be talking about one of the topics that I like most and with uh, amazing people. Uh, just to, to give a thought, um, we're talking about networked organizations. Um, how many networks do we belong to today? Do you have uh, awareness of how many networks do we belong to? No, we, it's, it's difficult to have it. But with, ex uh, with technology, especially uh, with WhatsApp, uh, we, know, we, get, we get to know how many groups do we belong to on a day-by-day basis. So are we talking about organizations, networks, or communities? And how all these relations between human beings and between organizations are changing, not only because of technology, but because of the complexity of the connections and uh, of the variables that we're dealing today. Uh, network, uh, uh, networks and network organizations, they always exist, existed. Uh, if we see nature and, and if, we, if we see human history, we see that uh, we belong to network. We always, we always belong to it. And why humankind has always tried to organize themselves and to, to structure their relations uh, in different ways. Because it's, it's a matter of survival. It's a matter of trying to do with uh, this synergy, this synchronicity, to, to, be, to preserve uh, their lives and to make um, things easier for, for the next generations and for, for their goals, for their dreams and ideas. And what is uh, emerging with technology is we are now uh, dealing with the opportunity to build networks and to deal with this with more uh, rhythm, with more speed, uh, and also uh, in, a major, in, a, in a bigger scale uh, to deal with the complexity of today's organizations. Um, talking about this, uh, we, we are going to have a panel now with three examples of organizations that are ahead of time and they are bringing new network ways and so I would like to welcome to the stage uh, Chelsea from Inspiro. <laughs> Maro Horta from uh, LabCoop. And Peter Langman from FairCoop. No, it's the opposite. FairCoop and LabCoop. Let me, let me get here. How do we, do we, did we structure this panel um, in a way to get all this experience to you? Uh, we are going to have a brief presentation of each one of them. And afterwards, 15 minutes of conversations of some emerging questions that we are aligned that are important about it. And afterwards, 10 minutes of Q&A from the audience. Okay? So please, Maru, okay, it's so your time. Welcome everyone. So I am going to speak a little bit about FECOP. What is FECOP? So um, this is an um, open cooperative that is organized through the internet and uh, we remain outside of nature and state controls. Uh, the aim of the FECOP is to reduce as much as possible the inequalities, uh, social and, and economic inequalities among human beings and to make a, transi a transition to a new model in which uh, we can redistribute this economic and, and this wealth through the human beings and as, as commons. So uh, to do that, uh, we uh, think that uh, we need to transform the monetary system. So uh, we are based on Faircoin. Faircoin is a cryptocurrency in which uh, we want to base the redistribution actions and uh, in order to create this new um, global economic system. So uh, how we organize, we are based on what Michelle Bowens uh, said that uh, open cooperativism uh, must, have, uh, must be uh, oriented to the, uh, toward to the common goods, um, must include in their governance models all the stakeholders. Um, we must produce intangible and material uh, goods, uh, common goods, and uh, we must be politically organized in a global basis, even if we are locally. 
We also think that is a key element the decentralization. This is why we are using this blockchain uh, technology. So uh, we have a main structure and transversal structures that is related to each product project. And some key elements is that uh, we have a continuous feedback from global to local to global. Uh, we organize and we have open assemblies. Uh, one key element, element is uh, that is free participation from everyone. Uh, um, uh, democratic decision making and uh, transparency is also a key element. We uh, publish all the minutes that uh, we have uh, in all the assemblies. We publish summaries about the assemblies also in order that everyone can know what we are doing and can join. So uh, oh, this is oops, the f what we call fair forest. So uh, as you see, we have a main tree uh, this is the economic uh, ecosystemic council and with some branches that is the IT development where it's focused this is a working group and it is focused on web development wallet developments we have also an extension area that is uh, related to welcome to the news and uh, to support the local nodes uh, we have the communication area that is supporting also uh, the local nodes and all the project in order to define all what we are doing and base it in the roots of this, uh, of course, the economic system that we are creating based on Faircoin and with uh, related projects like Fair Market, Cop Shares, etc. So uh, we have uh, the roots and also the seeds of this, uh, this tree that is creating other um, trees that is part of this fair forest. As a, a part of this is the, the local nodes tree that uh, we call it and the rest of the funds that we are creating like fair funds, the refugees funds that we created recently because of the, my, my, the refugees crisis that we are living and the Freedom Cop that is a, a cooperative of workers that we are creating in order to give uh, self-autonomy and self-independence to all the people that who wants to create productive uh, projects and uh, cannot or don't want to be linked to uh, the governments and, and, and the state systems. So uh, how we are organized, uh, you see that uh, we have working groups, we have projects and local nodes. So uh, individuals can be part of each group. They decide in, in a free and voluntary work which duties and which tax they are going to assume. So um, they have uh, internal autonomy. These groups are decentralized and non hierarchical uh, groups. So um, um, with a full internal autonomy to make decisions and to achieve the goals that uh, they assume. Um, we organize in open assemblies in order that we can discuss and debate and have feedback from all the crowd of the fair cop in order to make decisions and to go forward. And we are using also um, collaborative tools as uh, path tools that is on the internet and uh, canvas uh, like Trello in order to organize all the workflow from the different groups. Um, in the open assemblies, uh, we make all the key decisions and uh, so uh, it's a very important tool that we are using in order that everybody can join, can participate and can uh, decide with the rest of the people that is involved into the fair cop. Uh, this is a resume about uh, what we are doing. The working groups is related to the development of the tools that we are creating for this economic, this new economic system that we want to create. Projects is uh, based on human aid and also to help to develop uh, all the fair cop ecosystem. And the local nodes are the territorial extension of the fair cop. As uh, we uh, said before, uh, we are a cooperative that is organized through the internet, but we need to go to real life in order to uh, put into the real life all of these tools that we are creating and uh, to share with uh, different places all the, the experiences that we are, go are having in order to, to create a great model. So we need a constant feedback from global to local to global. So for the future, 
Uh, we are also thinking about how to develop democratic uh, process uh, by voting system based on blockchain and also reputation systems because this is what we need to be focused on in order that uh, we can create a great tool and in, in which is decentralized and with a free participation of everyone in all the decisions. Um, I am finished, so uh, if uh, I am going to leave the question for for the, uh, the next. Uh. So now um, I'd like to, to Chelsea to, to share your experience in Inspiro. Beautiful. Thank you for the fair co-op introduction. That was really great. <coughs> um, kia ora tato, or hello everyone. My name is Chelsea. I'm from New Zealand. Um, I've been involved in this network called the Inspiral Network for about three and a half years, working in various projects. The network itself um, exists to really help more people work on meaningful work with social and environmental good outcomes. And this shows up in a variety of ways. So we have uh, around about 300 people, both in New Zealand and around the world, working together on whether it's technology startups or services companies or activist projects, uh, whether people are administrators, philanthropists, accountants, whatever. Uh, there's a huge variety of people who are involved. Um, today I just want to, because we're talking about governance, I really want to focus on one of our entities called the Inspiral Foundation. The Inspiral Foundation, uh, as, as my dear friend says, is, the, is kind of like the campfire that we all sit around. Uh, and it's a legal structure which we can get into detail about. Um, so just to let you know, for those of you in the room, this won't be true on the video, but the screens are sh not showing all of the detail. So I'll talk you through. Um, in terms of the way that people are involved in governance in Inspiral, it's, it's a question of how much decision-making power do people have. Governance is about risk management, budget allocation, uh, decision-making about brand, all of these things. So the question, I guess, in a network is where do those things happen? Uh, and in the case of Inspiral, we have several circles, if you like. Uh, the, the circle that is probably best to start with is called the membership circle. Um, the Inspiral Foundation is a limited company, and the members are member shareholders, of which we have about 50, approximately. The next layer out from this is a, is a group of people called contributors to the Inspiral Network. And contributors are uh, active in decision making of all kinds through the network, um, but they cannot block a decision made by a member. So these members are more active custodians of the culture and of the direction of the network as a whole. In the outer sort of more loose arenas, we'd have friends of Inspiral. And in the very middle or the very bottom, I guess, depending on how you look at it, we have a board uh, of which there is only three people. We call them the minimum viable board. Uh, and they try to do as little as possible and really uh, divert power back to the membership and the contributor group. In terms of decision making, uh, as you were sharing also, Mara, in terms of we are an internet-based community in a lot of ways. And so most of our decision making happens on a tool called Lumio, of which I know the te some team members are in the room. Uh, Lumio is one of the ventures of Inspiral, and it's also been the core place we use to come together to make decisions. It means we can make decisions uh, asynchronously uh, across time and space with large groups. So. Not everyone has to agree for something to go ahead in the network. We can make a decision about how we want to invest our funding reserves or how we want to take forward a strategy for the next three years together across continents. And these conversations all happen on the online platform. Um, and as I say, the contributors are all in here as well as the members. So there is no sort of wall there, if you like. From a financial standpoint, because I think governance, again, is so much about how do we use our resource? Where do we direct our resource? So in Inspiral, every individual who's engaged in Inspiral can choose to give a voluntary contribution of finances. Most people uh, give around 20% of their income, and also companies give a voluntary contribution. About half of the money that you're giving as a contribution to the network uh, all, all of it's going into the foundation, just to be clear. About half of that goes to normal everyday running costs, and the other half goes into a tool that we've also uh, helped create in the network called CoBudget, of which also Derek will speak later about in another session. 
But co-budget allows each individual, say if 20% of my income this month is $40 or 400, whatever, it allows me to individually direct where that funding goes. So it's this combination of having made a network decision about allocating about 50% of all funds to network administration, et cetera, keeping us alive. And then there's also this experience of autonomy and directing your own funds in the way that you want to see them develop. In co-budget, anyone can raise a suggestion for how some funding can be used, and anyone who's creating a, a voluntary contribution can direct their own funding. We could go into great detail about this because we have many ways of managing money in Inspiral. This is only a hilarious picture drawn by my dear friend Alana to describe how her money flows through the network. And she also has written a great blog about this recently. But we really do have a stack of financial management tools uh, to really navigate together, gaining that kind of combination of collaboration and autonomy through the process. Um, and Spiral's gone through a lot of phases, so I think as I describe it today, it's not as it was first intended. And so starting from a very loose group of freelancers, uh, and you know, we've created a co-working space, disbanded a co-working space, started a development academy, shifted its attention to something else, it's really a constant growth process. Um, so I also want to really make that clear that we are constantly sharing as we evolve, and if you want a lot of detail about this project's development and spe specificity, there's an open site called handbook at uh, handbook.inspiral.com, which gives you our git book also of everything that we're doing in detail in this way. Um, also, I think it's worth uh, noting that often we just talk about governance as only being in these online tools, and for the growth and development of Unspiral, one of the key aspects has been our six monthly retreats. I'm sure many of you part of networks have kind of away days or three-day strategy deep dives, and for us as a whole network to come together every six months provides an opportunity to deepen friendships and create trust in such a way that if you need to make a quick decision with people online and you're on four different continents, you can actually achieve that because you, you know that you trust this person to, to make a good decision. Um, I think that's us for now. And also a question that I'm interested in discussing today is also what do different leadership practices look like if you're constantly trying to decentralize power, information, and money uh, to, you know, to deal with inequalities as well? What does leadership actually look like? So looking forward to talk more. Yeah. Thank you, Chelsea. Peter? Hey, everyone. I will need that thing. where it's quite a nightmare to try to get good IT related talents into a company because there are around 1 million open IT jobs just in the European Union. And uh, based on our previous experiences running different other companies, we realized that it's quite hard to make everyone in a team have that kind of owner mindset which the founders would and we wanted to eliminate uh, this kind of gap. Uh, and the third thing was that we haven't really had capital and we decided not to raise any uh, at the start of this organization. So these were the founding circumstances. And um, on the other hand, we realized that the barrier to enter to this market is basically zero. Uh, and uh, it's a seller's market because of the lack of professionals in the market. Um, and even though we have been doing um, startups before, we decided this time that we do service businesses, but wanted to make them as scalable as possible, even though these are not digital projects. So uh, we decided to create an organization which merges co-ownership and a kind of self-management. Uh, and it's important to see that even though I think we in this room share uh, lots of values in terms of co-ownership and, uh, and self-management uh, and communities, uh, it's important to underline that our approach is a market-driven one. So not because we believe in, or not only because we believe in, but we think 
that this can be a competitive advantage on the market. And it goes beyond beliefs. Uh, how many of you know holacracy in this room? Okay, I don't go into it, we do that. Um, and on the other hand, we started to research various co-ownership models. And if you look around, there are quite big corporations, companies, cooperatives doing this for decades in various forms, from profit sharing to total equal co-ownership in a cooperative. And in the midway, there are employee stock option pools uh, and employee-owned corporations. So there is a wide range uh, of quite large organizations we can learn from because they have been able to successfully use these as vehicles to create better decisions, to motivate their peers, and so on and so forth. Um, we decided to go somewhere to Midway and we decided to do an employee-owned corporation. It's legally not a cooperative. It's a corporation with a hacked bylaw and a hacked uh, shareholding agreement, which ensures that the power and the ownership is distributed within the organization. It is various reasons why we decided so. Um, it was just easier, faster, and more motivating for the later joining partners uh, to keep everyone in the company for the long run. Um, it means you'll earn 80% of your market salary. So similarly, as you have mentioned, uh, reinvesting 20% to do uh, the foundation in your case, we ask everyone to uh, leave 20% of that market salary in the organization. And this is basically a monthly buy-in, uh, what you get shares for. And it's an ongoing process. So by staying longer at the organization, uh, you're going to uh, accumulate these shares. we pay kind of an interest for everyone who has made this investment. So this is uh, the kind of logic, how we distribute shares within the organization. And here you can see our recent cap table. Right now, after one and a half year, we are 25 people, 25 shareholders. Uh, and that the tiny ones are the ones who joined like a month ago. Uh, and the bigger uh, chunks are people who were there in the first weeks, month. And um, if we wouldn't hire or bring in new partners, then in the long run, this algorithm would kind of equalize the ownership. But as we tend to grow uh, quite fast, all the older uh, shareholders going to dilute out and uh, lose that kind of majority which they have had at the beginning. So um, this is where we are now and where we are heading is, is trying to set up uh, a system where we can get rid that kind of legal relationship with the partners where they are also employees and we would like to become employee free and this is like the next step we would like to do. And uh, following that, we would like to try to focus on scalability and we think that for us, um, it means becoming kind of a platform uh, instead of uh, being a classic company. And if you look at TopTal, which is a similar uh, organization to us, then we can do this in a co-owned and self-managed way. And just a sentence about what we do. So we are primarily a digital agency, but we have a school, we have an IoT prototyping lab, and we are founding new and new organizations from that 20% money being reinvested. Thank you. For, for major questions. Um, we have three major topics that we have aligned that are important to, to be here in this panel. One of them is, is about um, inspiration and lessons. And I would like to bring to this issue the leadership issue. Uh, considering like the three of you were inspired with your groups on co-creating these this, uh, organizations with a question. 
Uh, and after this time, you mentioned it was three years ago. How many years ago it was uh, FAIR founded? One year and a half. And? One and a half. One and a half. So we're talking about new organizations here. What lessons have you already learned um, on con considering the, the, the initial question that inspired you to found the, the, the organization? Do you have already lessons learned? Yeah, and it would be quite bad if we haven't had any learning. Uh, I think because um, people with entrepreneurial background have founded the company, we didn't realize how much education we need to do, how much we need to invest into that to make everyone who is joining as a partner aware why it's a good thing to participate in decision making. What are the ways to do that? Why the heck you would like to own shares in a corporation? What is the upside? They were like, yeah, that sounds cool, so I become an owner, but why? So they haven't really seen uh, the processes behind. And uh, we started to focus much more in investing into that. So what uh, we think that um, what inspires to us is that uh, this system is not working for, for the most of us. So uh, we realize and we are focused on that we need to rethink and we need to change the way we uh, produce, the way we uh, receive finance or uh, investment, the way the economic system works. So uh, this is why we are trying to create an alternative model in which there is not so many competence, but uh, solidarity, that there is a more sharing and more cooperative way of doing the things. So uh, this is uh, what uh, we are inspired by, and we think that uh, we are focusing on it because we can create another model, another economic system uh, model in which uh, everyone can be into and the wealth could be shared between all of us. So I was not involved in the founding, just to be clear. I got involved about a year and a half in, but maybe that's also a blessing, right? That people around at the beginning don't need to be the ones talking on the stages. So I think we've just learned too many things for me to say anything like that is the, the most important lesson. But one that has been I've been realizing is important and very different, I think, from many organizations and networks. I've been traveling around uh, Europe and the US in the last six months, and I think one of the things we've learned that is distinctly unique is the importance of facilitation and consideration for cultural development as something to invest deeply in. So originally just being a network of uh, like software developers, in essence, how do you bring the, the feminine energy, the, the sort of the um, the thinking about emotional c considerations of what we do. How do you bring this to the fore and realize that one of the problems with our current economy is that this is not appreciated as much? You know, this is a, it's a, uh, a lesser appreciated in a traditional society, sort of e economically less recognized. So one of the kind of curious new edges for us is about recognizing more and more within the network things that are really making it thrive uh, over time and sort of becoming in some ways the new economy that we want to participate in more broadly through investing in different types of things that a normal economy may just forget or be blind to the value of it. Does this make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, the second issue that we're talking about is like the rela relationship between realities, different realities. We're talking about also existing companies and existing organizations that are trying to do this transition to a different model of relationship, of governance, and so on. Um, what, what kind of experience, Peter has mentioned some organizations here that are already working like that. Uh, do you have any uh, experiences that you have already noticed in your ecosystem of organizations that are doing this transition in an admirable way? Well, in the case of FairCop, uh, we have so many experiences based in local nodes. 
So uh, what we are doing is uh, basically to provide some tools to all of these um, projects that is on, on, on different places on, in, in the world that uh, we are very uh, active in Greece, for example. We are very active in Spain also. So uh, we are helping to this uh, project, these cooperatives, these associations, and uh, these uh, projects related to uh, sharing economy, solidarity economy, to provide this kind of tool. So uh, for them, I think that it's very interesting to see that we can uh, develop another economic model uh, using different tools that we are using uh, normally. So for them, I think that uh, we are uh, very focused on, on them because uh, they can give us this experience and, and, and the feedback in order that we can create this, uh, this new models. So. Um, I think it's an ongoing exchange. Like you have said, we tried to learn from those existing best practices. When we had a quite easy case because it was a greenfield project, so we could, you know, implement the best fit uh, approaches. Uh, and for companies or in the in the market for a while, it's a much more challenging process to do the transition. So this is why I am confident to say that this is a competitive advantage for us uh, at the moment. And it's really great to see how many companies uh, want to uh, collaborate with us and do co-learning and sharing best practices and started to implement similar systems. And that kind of collaboration will help everyone in our ecosystem um, to get better and better in these uh, approaches. On the other hand, uh, I definitely think that you, if you can evolve your governance, decision-making processes, and so on faster than the other companies, uh, then you can be ahead of them in the competition. And, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, it's a business, uh, even though it's purpose-driven, even though it's co-owned, which is trying to get clients faster than the other competitor. I'd like to also share one experience that, uh, one point that you, you brought uh, about how the connection of what this, these startups and the, this, this organization that are emerging, uh, connecting with uh, old model organizations and bringing this new combination. Uh, in Brazil, I have been working the last one year and a half with L'Oreal and Brazil uh, on the, the we're doing a project on the value chain, and when we are uh, we are now like they they accept the idea to co-create with the the suppliers a solution of development. So it was uh, there are, they have the compromise for 20 and 20 the sustainability com uh, compromise. So by 2020 they're going to be uh, choosing the suppliers according to environmental and social issues. So in Brazil, we brought the suppliers together to co-create with them what is going to be the development processes. And they chose to build a network of suppliers to connect uh, one with each other just to deal with social and environmental impact. So it's something <coughs> co-relating different um, worlds in, in, in big corporations' issues. Uh, and the, the, the third point that we chose was to say, what's next? We are talking about new models. They are already talking about future. But what's next? And then I, I'd like to include here uh, one point about scalability, um, about leadership, and about uh, dealing with capitalism and other models. So I would like to hear a little bit about you, from you. I can begin if you like. I think one of the recent uh, things, at least in, in my thinking, and I know for some others also, is how do we think of these networks, not as networks which benefit the people in them, but networks which exist as a platform to create value, both for the people in them and elsewhere. One of the concepts that we've been uh, discussing is how do we activate network leadership that isn't just a group of people that were the original founders continuing to scheme and scheme and scheme into the future and have everyone else follow along, but how do we have a protocol-based leadership structure? So one of the things we've begun experimenting with uh, is really looking at, okay, if I get two other people together and we say, we think that Derek would be a good person to, to actually be a, a network catalyst, is what we've 
talked about calling them, is, it, uh, yes, we'll get together and support him to be a catalyst, uh, both financially and uh, in solidarity with his, his vision. So in this way, you kind of have a protocol uh, set of uh, agreements that allow leadership to come from anywhere. And this is very much the beginning of our experimentation in this regard. But I think that it is, goes along with a bigger way of thinking, which is stop thinking like an organization and start thinking like a platform. And then you don't have this discussion of, oh, well, we need a committee for this, or where's the executive leadership team, or whatever, because it's like the entire platform needs to be alive with activity in order for us to be creating the most value possible in every space possible. Um, another way of thinking about this is how can Inspiral be a platform for uh, these large organizations like L'Oreal, how can they be uh, activated through their true potential through becoming engaged with the Inspiral network rather than Inspiral creating all of the value and L'Oreal dying. It's not about this necessarily because these platforms can activate a different kind of activity also through meeting in a middle space that's not about competition but about collaboration and, and value creation. Does mm -hmm. this make sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in our case, what's next? Uh, almost everything. <laughs> So uh, because uh, what we are doing is to, to rethink uh, everything in a, in a holistic way. I mean, uh, we are not only focused on, on economic system, that this is very important for us, and uh, we are developing based on blockchain and, and fake coin, that is our cryptocurrency, but not only in the monetary system, but also in the financial and economic system in itself. So uh, what we are doing is develop these new tools that uh, help to create a new economic system, but also we need to rethink uh, the way that we behave all the, as, as human beings, as a society. So uh, we are trying also to rethink in this, in this, with this point of view and how we are going to interconnect between us, how we are going to use these new tools, this uh, technology that is uh, emerging and uh, using the internet that will allow us to be connected, wherever you are. So uh, uh, how we are going to be productive and how we are going to, to, to create these new networks in this way, this new way of thinking in which we can share between all of us and to, to, to contribute to a new world. So uh, for us, uh, what's next is everything. So we need and we want to rethink about everything in all the aspects. So this is one of the points of the Fair Cop. Uh, one of the principles of the FACOR that we are based is in uh, what we call the integral revolution. So it means that uh, we, we need to rethink everything in a holistic way. Not only economically, not only social, but also even spiritually, uh, in a spiritual way. So um, this is where we are focused on and uh, we hope that uh, everybody that wants to join can help us because this is a process of coll uh, in coll intelligence, uh, collective intelligence. So uh, everyone must participate, everybody must participate into it in order that uh, we can create the better, the best system that we can. Um, I couldn't agree more with your point uh, in terms of the future being becoming a platform. Uh, and this is why uh, one of the key points for me in terms of our future is becoming closer to a, a platform cooperatist uh, organization um, and shifting from organization to platform. The other thing is that if you would like to have uh, a legal body, then it's not trivial to get rid of the uh, employer-employee relationship. So the laws are not set that way. And um, you ha have to advocate, you have to find your ways around the different kind of laws to make sure that everyone is only a partner, only a shareholder, and has no other relationship to the organization and to each other. So uh, we see these two uh, challenges uh, ahead of us. Um, I would like to open for Q&A. Is anyone interested here, please? Um. Hi, well, uh, thank you. It's very interesting. Um, I wonder, like, how do you do to have the initial investment? Because you talk about how, you know, the salary, 20% of the salary goes into to invest in the company. But how do you get the very first money to bootstrap a network? 
Well, in our particular case, it was um, convincing um, a company to work with our small first team. And um, they have promised that if we incorporate and we invoice them, then they're going to pay. Uh, so we did. So basically, they have paid uh, us the initial money. So I think getting climbed first is kind of a good approach to that. In our case, uh, we have our own currency, so it is fair coin. So uh, we have uh, all the money that in the in uh, the beginning that uh, we need. But it's true that uh, fair coin is not useful for to pay the energy or the websites or also so. Uh, uh, until we can have this complete economic system, uh, we are well. It's important to say that um, our work is mainly free and voluntary, so uh, we did not we don't need some high resources. And um, uh, the uh, fiat money that we have just now, but for some necessities like website maintenance and uh, to to pay the the work of the developers, uh, it comes from the contributors. We are part of the Fair Cop, and we also are contributors to the Fair Cop, uh, buying our uh, money, our Fair Coin. We are buying it with euros, and we are keeping it as a reserve of value of the whole ecosystem. So uh, this is the way we 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 have finance. We don't need so much resources at this very beginning point, so um, we can do it. Freelancers pooling savings. Hero savings. <laughs> um, we we still have time for one question. We have one there, please. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Peter, but well, you f feel free to to answer if you want. Um, as far as I understand, you pay like a bonus to all the employees, partners every month or every year, I don't know. Uh, I was wondering what happens when someone drops off. So if I leave the company, uh, do I keep my shares and do I keep my bonuses for a while? How, how does it work? So we don't pay bonuses, we pay salary uh, in a sense. Uh, and we pay that until you are part of the organization. If you have stayed longer than one year, then you can keep your existing shares. Of course, you're going to dilute faster than those who are still at the organizations and are gaining new shares. Have I answered your question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so many new issues and many new, new things to learn. Um, I'm sure there are many questions left, but we, we, we are on time now, right? Uh, yeah, we can? Okay, is there anyone? Um, another one? Here, please. Hi. I was trying to, to be, to be <laughs> on to be time. Quick. Yeah, okay. Hi, thanks for the great speech. Uh, it was really inspiring. I got a question for LabCop2. What do you mean by becoming employee-free, and how do you combine that with you viewing yourself as a corporation. Thanks. Well, this is why it's tricky. <laughs> uh, but um, the whole point is that at the moment, um, everyone who works with us has two kind of legal relationships with the organization. One is signing a shareholder agreement as an owner, and one is signing an employment agreement as an employee. Uh, it's true for me and everyone else. And uh, we think that uh, we would like to shift towards being only a shareholder and doing work as a shareholder because we think that that kind of employee-employer relationship is just um, destroying uh, the culture. And legally, it is a must at this point, but we are trying to find our way around this. Any other question? Can you speak? Um, the question was why we don't do uh, something similar, I guess, where you have started, please elaborate that, in terms of freelancers coming together and forming an organization. Uh, the reason is 
uh, that in, uh, in many cases it's kind of beneficial to have a legal body where every individual is a shareholder when it comes to fundraising, when it comes to having a legal presence for third parties. Um, so, um, and we wanted to create a um, local team uh, where everyone is sticked to one body. So this is why we uh, are not going down the freelancer road. That's that comes to a legal thing again. If you um, in certain laws, uh, at, at least in Europe, if you um, give job to a freelancer in full time, then the government or the tax authority is going to tell you that hey, you are employing that guy. Why don't you pay the pay those increased taxes? So it's not that easy. <laughs> Yeah, so we're talking about local challenges too. Do, do you want to compliment? Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to fi finish the panel uh, giving you the word to uh, bring to the public what question is burning now in your organizations that are not answered yet. There are so many. I think one of them is... Uh, how do we be a translocal platform? How, how do you truly be an organization that has a heart and a culture and a connection of deep trust and not be in one place? Um, how, how do we have a group of people in San Francisco who feel like they are part of the Inspiral Network, a group of people in Australia, a group of people in Berlin, a group of people in Budapest, whatever? How, and how does that still be in Spiral and in its essence? Um, so I think this, we are still exploring what this could really mean, yeah. So our question is, uh, how we, uh, can we deal with capitalism during the transition uh, of a new system that we are trying to, to create, not only in the sense of economic or financial system, but also in the way that society behaves uh, I am referring that uh, now we are living in a society that is individualistic, that is uh, based on competition, on greed. So how we are going to change our minds also in order that uh, we can have the uh, new model in which uh, we will be more solidary, in which uh, we share and we cooperate more than the, the system that we have now. So uh, this is a, a big challenge, I think. For us, it's um, definitely the scalability of this competitive advantage and trying similar things which uh, you have mentioned in terms of Inspire. And being very vulnerable with all of you, I'm learning a lot with you. Uh, Paris has six years. We started as partners. Then after four years, we did our participatory uh, planning. And we saw that we had different visions of future. And so we decided not to be partners anymore and to work as a network. So now I, I work uh, uh, as a network and we associate for projects. But I'm still, I, I, I'm not comfortable with this model yet. So I know I have a lot to learn. But by now I'm very just being very practical and each project has a team and that's how it's working and in Brazil you have to to hire the team and also pay the taxes again so there are challenges also so what came what what um, is now for me after this talk is that we are all learning and we can learn better together it's gonna be a pleasure thank you